Hi, my name is Brandon Ayers. I'm from the Cornea Service at Wills Eye Hospital, and my private practice is called Ophthalmic Partners. I want to talk a little bit about the building blocks of, uh, of IOL Exchange. These are my financial interests, nothing that will impact the subject matter of today's talk. So this course is going to be basically a video discussion on how to perform an IOL exchange. And the cases will start with a more routine case and then progress to slightly more complex cases. Now, we're not going to go too over the top with this. We're going to do primarily uh, the, the run-of-the-mill IOL exchanges with uh, closed posterior capsule and open posterior capsule. So why do an IOL exchange in the first place? Well, we've got refractive surprises after cataract surgery, either malposition or malfunction of an IOL, a damaged or dislocated implant, dissatisfaction with lens performance, and we see that in the premium lens market in some cases. We still see uveitis glaucoma hyphema syndrome with a one in, one out, and sometimes you need to do an IOL exchange to help you with another anterior segment surgery. Now, the latter portions of this we're probably not going to discuss uh, in this talk. But some of the clinical pearls for IOL exchange, well, you know, I remember very vividly the first time I did an IOL exchange. I was pretty nervous. I put lots of lenses in, but hadn't taken too many out, and I wasn't quite sure what was going to happen during that surgery. So the thought can be a little bit scary when it's a new procedure, but if you've already mastered cataract surgery, you already have the skills for implant removal and exchange. A couple of things to make your life easier, if you think a lens exchange is going to be necessary, don't open the posterior capsule. Now that is the assumption that the capsule is not already open. Sooner is definitely better, but there is no such thing as it's too late for an IOL exchange. Uh, I would say within the first six months, an implant exchange is relatively straightforward, but I've taken IOLs out in the capsular bag years after they've been placed. And sometimes if you're exchanging an anterior chamber lens, although not in the subject matter for this talk, there's often enough residual capsule to hold a sulcus lens. Just during the primary surgery, the surgeon didn't recognize that or it was difficult to see due to corneal edema or other issues. Basic steps are pretty straightforward. We're going to visco dissect the optic and the haptics of the IOL, carefully bring the implant into the anterior chamber with plenty of OVD, Remove the lens from the anterior chamber, and there's a variety of ways to do this. I like to cut the implant into multiple pieces, but you can also refold them, or some implants you can simply carefully pull out of the wound as they're very uh, rubbery and stretchy, and they'll squeeze out through a small wound. And then you place your new IOL either in the capsular bag, anterior chamber, sulcus, or suture fixate, depending on what you're going to have to do. Now, you might need some additional equipment. Uh, hopefully, you don't need too much suture material, but you will need some additional viscoelastic. You may need a vitrector. You might want triamcinolone on standby. You will need, or I would recommend, having some micro-instrumentation. I like to use a Packer Chang IOL cutter and a micro forcep to help remove the implant. And like I said before, make sure that you are ready for vitrectomy, even in a case where you didn't initially plan on doing the vitrectomy. So let's take a look at our first case. This is an in-the-bag IOL exchange with a closed posterior capsule with a little clinical vignette. A uh, 65-year-old woman who had LASIK in 2001, had some progressive myopia due to advancing lens changes, and went in for uneventful cataract surgery. But after her surgery, she had an unwanted refractive surprise of astigmatism, astigmatism that she at least didn't think that she had before that surgery. This is what the topography looks like for the patient and the manifest refraction showed about two diopters of astigmatism at axis 180. Now, if you look at the axial topography, and we overlay that on the patient's eye, you know, I don't really see much astigmatism in the axis that the eye well is placed. Now, if we look at the colorimetric representation of the refraction, we'll see there's about two diopters of astigmatism 90 degrees away from the axis of the IOL. So after a little bit of further digging, what we figured out was the implant was placed in the wrong eye. The implant that was intended for one eye was placed in the other, and the other eye was supposed to be a toric, not this eye. So now what do we do? Well, we got some non-surgical options of glasses and contact lenses. We could do laser refractive surgery, or we could tackle the lens. Now, I will say this implant has been in the eye for just over a year, and you can see a little fibrosis of the capsule. But let's take a look and see the steps here of the IOL exchange. Now, lucky uh, here, we're going to be exchanging a toric and not placing another toric. This is simply a IOL exchange toric for spherical. But you've got to get that anterior capsule to lift up. So I'm now using a 
fairly cohesive OVD underneath the dispersive to try and lift up that capsular bag. And that was an upside down 25 gauge needle that I was trying. Didn't work real well, so I'm going to go in with a micro forcep, an atraumatic micro forcep, and use it like a shoehorn. Hold the anterior capsule, and then go beneath it with a viscoelastic cannula and try to open up that capsular bag. You'll see actually the anterior and posterior leaflets begin to separate. And you need to visco dissect all the way back to the terminal bulbs on this, uh, this IOL platform. Then the move here is to lift. You want to lift the implant up out of the capsular bag. This is not a spin move because likely the other haptic is still incarcerated in the capsular bag. So you lift these implants up, pick them up into the anterior chamber. And then using uh, an IOL cutter, and this is the Packer Chang IOL cutter, and a micro forcep, or a variety of ways. There's multiple ways that you can take an implant out. Um, you remove the existing implant through the, your main incision, and then you can place your new implant. Now, a couple of tips here is make sure that the capsule bag is completely open. Very often, I'll work very hard to get the capsule open in the area of the haptics, but not 360 degrees around. And then when you go to place your new IOL, it doesn't seem to fit right. And that's because the haptics are trying to open into an area that you haven't opened up. So certainly if we had to do another toric and that toric was at a different axis, we would need to make sure that our implant, sorry, our capsular bag was completely opened before that new implant went in. But in this case, it's a spherical lens. So as long as it goes back where the old one was, we're just fine. And from here on, it's just a regular cataract. Now, another way that you can use to fixate a capsular bag, and I, sorry, to, to fixate the IOL for exchange, and a nice technique, and this is going to be uh, shown, this is my partner, Dr. Rich Tipperman, who actually did this uh, exchange during live surgery during one of the ASCRS meetings. And you can see that toric IOL is already lifted up into the anterior chamber, and he went ahead and put the new implant in the capsular bag before the old lens even came out. Now, what that does is that keeps that posterior uh, capsule back to make sure you can't mistakenly grab it with the scissor and cut it. Now you saw me fixate the IOL on the inside with a micro forcep. He's using the haptic to, to fixate the implant so you don't just simply push the IOL across the eye while you're trying to cut it. Now I've got to tell you that acrylic IOLs cut much easier than silicone IOLs. Silicone IOLs really get pushed across the eye. You got to hold them pretty tightly. All right, let's look at another example of an IOL exchange in the bag. And this is a plate haptic IOL that's half in and half out of the capsular bag. Now, plate haptics are a little bit different because they don't rotate very easily. And they're really a pain to cut because they're silicone. So in this case, it's actually quite simple because half of the IOL was already lifted up above the capsule. So we simply amputated that. And by carefully grabbing the edge of the implant, you can see I already tore it once by trying to pull it, but very slowly pulling and stretching, we can just basically pull this implant for the most part through the temporal incision. Now to get the rest of it, we're going to have to cut it in half and then take it out in smaller pieces. Now we were lucky in this, in this case that we were able to maintain the anterior capsule and posterior capsule. And after a lot of polishing because of a fairly dense PCO, we were able to get a three piece IOL into the capsular bag without difficulties. This was a one in one out syndrome with a closed posterior capsule. We we're replacing it for a three piece IOL in the capsular bag. Now I chose a three piece IOL just in case we weren't able to get it into the capsular bag. It'd go into the sulcus nicely. So here, careful visco dissection, cut the IOL into small pieces. Holding the IOL is certainly more of a challenge when it comes to the plate haptic IOLs and use plenty of OVD to protect that cornea. Now another IOL exchange. My preference is to try to traumatize the wound as little as possible. So again, here you'll see an upside down 25 gauge needle on viscoelastic and let that viscoelastic egress. You don't want to overpressurize the eye. And there you can see that the anterior and posterior leaflets open. A little bit of fibrosis. Now on the Johnson & Johnson platform, the most adherent section of the lens is going to be right at that haptic optic junction where that little cutout is. On the Alcon platform, the most challenging portion to dissect is going to be the more distal or terminal bulb on the, uh, on the haptic. But the same applies here. Once you get things freed up, you want to lift that IOL up into the anterior chamber, making sure you've fully visco dissected the haptics. And now you can go in with the scissor and a micro forcep, and both of these are going to be working together. 
um, the scissor holds, the holder holds, and you can use both hands to cut this implant. And you don't want to cut the scissor all the way through. You don't want to squeeze the handle all the way. You want to leave the scissor a little bit open so that it doesn't close inside the IOL, which can make it challenging to find the track that you are cutting. So uh, go a little slow with that scissor. And here we are putting a new implant in the capsular bag once again. So right, help preserve that small wound by cutting the implant in small pieces. Use the scissors and the holder together like a hand. So you have almost two hands in the anterior chamber and don't cut the scissors all the way down and then take that implant out in small pieces. Now, what if you have an open posterior capsule? Now you're going to have to do a vitrectomy, but it doesn't mean you can't do an IOL exchange. So here's a case of somebody who's dissatisfied with a positive dysphotopsia. We've had our multifocal IOL in the capsular bag for a couple of years before we finally agree to do the exchange. And clearly you can see the open posterior capsule. But our ABCs, our rules of IOL exchange are still the same. We're gonna try and visco dissect the IOL. And here you'll see there's a little nub. See that nub is still stuck. So we haven't fully visco dissected. So we're gonna take our OVD, we're gonna free up that terminal bulb. And to make things a little bit easier, now that we've got that haptic, one haptic fixated, or sorry, freed, we're gonna remove it. Now what that does, that allows us to have an easier angle to truncate the other haptic. Now that haptic you could leave. If you were having a hard time uh, getting that, that haptic out, you could leave it right where it is and we'll put a sulcus implant in and, and nobody will know and nobody will care and the eye's just fine. But what we're gonna do is remove the optic and by getting the optic out of the way, it's going to open up some surgical angles that we didn't have before. So we can go back, we can grab onto that optic that is well enshrouded, right, in capsule, and we can carefully visco dissect it off. Now we have an open posterior capsule, and that means we're going to have to do a vitrectomy. So I like to put in a little triamcinolone and always do a two port vitrectomy in these cases. Sometimes we'll do a pars plana vitrectomy. And I would strongly encourage the use of triamcinolone so you can really see where the vitreous is. So careful visco dissection, cut and remove your IOL, a two port vitrectomy, place the IOL in the sulcus. And my personal preference is haptic, sorry, optic fixate this. So we're gonna, oh, actually I forgot. We're gonna put in a bent IOL so we get to exchange it again. So this is a two for one IOL exchange. But we're going to place that implant eventually in the sulcus, hopefully without a bent haptic. And I don't like to leave an implant passively fixated in the sulcus. I will always try and either capture it in the anterior rexus, or if I need to, I'll suture to the iris. I've just seen too many sulcus lenses end up dislocating down the road without some kind of fixation technique. So here we are pushing that implant through the anterior rexus, creating that football-shaped rexus that really locks the vitreous behind the IOL. Now, those, and those haptics are sitting up in the sulcus. So there's a well-fixated and positioned sulcus IOL. Another example of an open posterior capsule. Now, this is a unique one, but you can see we have a multifocal IOL. This is the Johnson Johnson platform, so we're going to have to really work at that haptic-optic junction and we have an open posterior capsule. So we're gonna go in with our OVD. And here I find the easiest spot to get in between the leaflets is right at the, hop, the haptic optic, optic junction. We're gonna extend and you can see this OVD going between the leaflets, sort of ballooning up the, the capsule. We're gonna go all the way around 360 degrees to try and open up that capsular bag so we can get this implant out uh, safely. Very important in this case, at least from my perspective, to keep that anterior rexus. So now we're going to look and we're going to see if we have our implant freed up. It looks like we do. And now we'll use that lifting move to bring that implant up into the anterior chamber. Remember, this is not so much a spin as it is a lift. And now we can pull the other way, get that IOL up and into the anterior chamber. Once again, using our micro scissors and micro forcep, we're going to cut this implant probably into two or three pieces. Now, people often ask me, hey, is that implant going to fall into the eye? Are you worried about leaving that little piece sitting up there? Really, there's so much OVD in the eye that those pieces are sitting in a, a viscoelastic jello. And uh, to date, I've never lost a piece of IOL back to the vitreous when there was a viscoelastic. Now, if that's all you know, BSS or saline, yep, they're going to fall right back. So just be a little bit careful. But here we are taking our our pieces out through the temporal incision, grab by the very end of that. I hate it when people bring that haptic out backwards. It drives me nuts. It traumatizes the wound a little bit, traumatizes the attending a little bit. We'll do a vitrectomy. Now notice we have not 
disturbed that posterior capsulotomy and we have an intact capsular rexus. So we're gonna check and make sure there's no vitreous left by using a little triamcinolone and doing our two port vitrectomy. And here I'm actually able to use a three piece IOL and put it into the capsular bag. So this is not going into the sulcus, it's going right back into the capsular bag, right where it belongs. So here we have an open posterior capsule IOL exchange with an in the bag for in the bag exchange. Now again, I use that three piece IOL because I never imagined I'd get this implant out and not disturb the posterior capsule, but in this case we were able to. So it just goes to show sometimes you win when you're using the right techniques. So careful dissection again, cut and remove the IOL, a two port vitrectomy, and in this case, put the lens in the capsular bag. So a quick review. IOL exchange can be a challenging surgical procedure, but is well within the skill set of the comprehensive ophthalmic surgeon. Okay, being prepared in the operating room, both mentally and with the correct instrumentation, is essential for a good outcome. And know the details on the type of IOL being removed and the status of the capsule. That way you have the right equipment available to you. And be ready to manage vitreous, especially with a known posterior capsular violation. But I'd also say sometimes even if you don't know that there's a posterior capsular violation, always be ready with vitrectomy. Thank you very much.